All right, so we want to kick off our keynote speaker section today. Um, he has a very interesting presentation. It's called Quo Vadis Cybersecurity into Advanced Cyber Threats and Cyber Securities Failure. One more flash poll. How many people here believe that sitting right now in this room, if there were to be a cyber attack, there would be a way to defend ourselves from a cyber attack? No one believes that. All right, that's a great way to start. All right, please give a warm round of applause to the Chief Executive Officer at F-Secure, Mr. Christian Fredrickson. <laughs> Enjoy. Thank you. Yeah, Kovad is cybersecurity. I'm going to show you the future. That's a great starting. And uh, there was a comment earlier that uh, should you be worried? Uh, F-Secure was started 28 years ago, which was one year before the internet. And uh, we've been on the good guy's side. We're trying to make sure that people shouldn't be worried, but they can enjoy life on the internet. However, uh, nowadays, when companies get hacked, some CEOs even get fired. Being a CEO, that worries a little bit, at least. And uh, the question is, of course, why do you fire a CEO if a company gets hacked? Uh, I suppose one is that they feel that the, they have not pushed cybersecurity thinking inside a company. Maybe the board members have felt that they need to at least show that they are doing something after a hack of devastating proportions, right? And uh, if I just look at through a few of the latest things that has, has been happening in, in this space, also in terms of uh, some of the CEOs getting hit, and then going through a little bit what the future might look for us. Uh, there is a CEO spam uh, that is flying around, which has been actually quite a lot of attention. And even our company, F-Secure, has gotten emails in my names, which are asking for information and something to be paid by an email. Please pay this urgent M&A activity is happening, and you need to pay this invoice immediately or pay to this account amount because we don't have time. It's a good deal. I want it to move fast. Even we have gotten those emails. And it is surprisingly easy, actually, to make them the CEO spam or CEO fraud. And uh, here you see, actually, just use LinkedIn. I'm going to show you some of the social media, which is a great part of social media, and then the other side of it, why it's so easy to use it today. So basically, we just went and took out name accountant in Finland or Helsinki, and you get a list of names, and you get, you know, basically, who is taking care of the accounting for the company. And you can, of course, from there move on. And today, it's about 1.2 billion uh, that FBI has estimated that only by these emails that are not basically putting viruses in. It's like the old African ways of that we saw the mails that came from Africa that were on letters earlier. So this is like sent with the CEO nowadays. So it's quite a lot of money just on simple things like checking the social media once and sending a spam email and uh, you get payments into your accounts of these amounts, 1.2 billion in this overall over 100 billion in losses from companies, right? And uh, if I then look at a little bit more about the CEOs that have gotten the attack here, because that's, of course, an interesting part in our industry at the moment. So a lot of, le a lot of push from the board members, and at least from the leaderships of companies, you should ask, you know, maybe not be worried, ask, what are the three to five things in your company or in your personal life? I mean, that's all you need to do, but if you do a basic assessment, what would be the most painful thing for you personally or in your company if these three to five things got taken away from you now? And then you assess that that's all, right? You don't have to do this very big assessment even, but if you can do that and you think about, okay, if I think about F-Secure, for example, I can tell you that if somebody would get into our updating mechanism when we update our cloud systems or the devices, which would be, that would be pretty devastating, right? So if you think about it, that would really concern myself. And I think that those kind of places, many companies have, software companies are doing updates, so if somebody gets into that flow, I would imagine that is a devastating hack for that company, because then you will basically get into every customer case, right, that you have. And that has happened. So you take uh, Target, I'll show you three uh, CEOs that got fired, and, and uh, 
I'm sure, and I hope that there won't be too many, but giving you the big ones, right? So Target CEO, 40 million customer data was taken, 160 million dollar losses in that one case for the company. Sony Pictures, of course, the co-chairman, co-chairwoman uh, uh, got fired as well. Sony Pictures, of course, once one, we don't have to get into the case. I'm sure you all know about it. One of the really big ones uh, uh, when it comes to an attack. And of course, then Ashley Madison, CEO, getting fired. Uh, 37 million, uh, uh, the cheater sites, uh, where 37 million of their customer data was actually then hacked and given out to the public. So there you see a few of the examples where, when you think about it once again, what would be, is it IPRs, is it pictures, whatever you have, which are the three to five things, which if somebody gets to them, that would be extremely devastating for you or your company. The way we try to look at it, I'll go through a bit of, of in terms of how we try to look at this in terms of threat modeling. So understanding, one is to understand what is important for you if we start with that. What's the most important data that you have or the most important information that you have? And how do you then, can you can start thinking, so how do I protect it? How do I train? How do I check that it is protected systematically? And then how do I recover if it gets hacked? If you do those steps, you're already doing quite a lot in terms of where you could be. And, and if I look at the threat modeling, uh, from our side, so basically showing you the categories that we have in terms of who could be the, ha who could be the attacker. So from, that's another one to understand, of course, not only what is important for you, but actually what is the attacker? How do they look? How, who would be interested in your data and why? And I'll give you the way we have looked at it in terms of five different categories that gives you a picture. Uh, in terms of what it is in the market that we see. Nothing fancy, just we all realize these, these cases for us, right? So let's start with uh, the white hackers. Uh, this, here you see uh, Charlie Miller and Chris Valasek, who are basically hacked the Chrysler Jeep, right? And, and uh, they are guys who do it for the good cause. They want to find holes, and they want to tell you that you have a hole. So they informed uh, last year, in February, they informed Chrysler about that they have hacked uh, uh, their Jeep, and they gave them six months time before they would reveal it, right? So six months time to fix that, and I'll show you in, in terms of how they tried to fix this, which is actually a challenge in the industry as well, in terms of how do you fix this. But these are white hackers who are on a good course, so to say, in, in that perspective. Then you have, of course, the anonymous, uh, uh, I, I suppose Ashley Madison was a case of at least they claim that they did it, right? So that's basically they, for whatever political or moral reasons they see themselves doing, they will hack it, whether it's a government site or whether it is sites like Ashley Madison, they will do that to shame and, and get their own name up, of course. And. Uh, then you have uh, Valuskis, uh, a criminal who, who did uh, Goji Trojan, and, and uh, he actually was one who was caught. So the criminals, of course, are the big one. These are the big ones that we work against, and we work together with authorities to also find these, these people, right? So the, these are, of course, the ones who have a very simple target to get to your data, which is to make money. So the question is, what do you have if you have anything which is valuable? And there, of course, the CEO spam uh, is one new category that is coming coming into is into the industry now, and uh, these guys, of course, only go for the money. And you get this question: Then why would anybody want to hack your fridge? And and obviously nobody wants to hack your fridge, right? They don't want to go in there and switch the lights off or something, right? That's not the, that's not the point. The point is, of course, that if we hack, or if they hack your s fridge or whatever baby monitors we've seen in the Internet of Things era now, whatever they have, they have. The reason is, of course, that it is either a direct vertical into your network, right? So in a company, that water cooker, which is connected to the Internet, I don't know if it's wise to connect everything to the Internet, by the way. Maybe every water cooker shouldn't be connecting to the Internet, but the problem is that they tend to be. Everything that comes out will be connected. So it's a way in, of course. That's not... They don't want to get into the product itself, but it's just a way in. I'll show you soon a bit of what we have done in this space. Then, of course, you have the military. 
and, uh, and uh, all the different nations, which you wouldn't have thought that would happen. And now we see, when we look at this globally and we see from our systems, uh, in terms of F-Secure and our cloud security, we of course gather all the information. And we can see now when certain regions have certain things happening. So when Ukraine happened and the Krim, we can see how there are more cyber attacks in that space. There's more malware, there's more attacks, there's more advanced attacks. Whether it's protests in Hong Kong or it's protests or actions in, in Syria, Libya, we can see how the attacks increase in those zones. It's a bit scary, and that's the way it's functioning. It is part of the way it works. And you see governments hacking and attacking their own people as well, whether it is journalists in media or whether it is just demonstrators, right? So you see how the tool is being used in, in terms of all the military in the world. And I think the fifth, uh, which has been very small so far, but we see the first actions in terms of gathering for money is, of course, terrorist organizations such as ISIS, where they actually see that as one way of funding and getting attention as well for them. So you see the first activities here. It has not been a big threat as our people have analyzed as well, but you can already see what it does. Let me get you into something uh, very different in terms of how the future might look, man, because everything, when you look about our ways, is everything gets connected. Whether you like it or not, your fridge, your washing machine will be connected. It's not up to you anymore. They will have a chip in it and it will connect. And uh, once you take that in to your house or into the office, it will be connected. It is a beautiful world as well. It will make life easier. It will make it more fun, smooth, easy. Everything around you knows who you are, when you are, and opens up and registers you. And life has many great things in it. And I will show you two different versions of that, that, that life. And I would love to show you first what speed and smooth and optimizing all this world with software can do for you. We have seen what it is about Uber doing in a taxi world. We've seen that with Airbnb in hotel rooms. You do the same with cars, which are 95% idle. So you can actually put your car for rental when you go into the office. So you're optimizing everything around us. You're utilizing it with software and data analysis. It's an incredible, smoother, funner, greater world from that perspective. And we love that ourselves as well. So let me show you how the traffic will look when you are walking around when everything around you is automated and you are not even allowed to drive a car anymore. So I'm going to show you one video from the traffic here. you walk in that traffic? Quite interesting, right? And that's, uh, that's in terms of what we have uh, when you look at the traffic and what you can do with optimization. Quite impressive. And it will make everything smoother, a bit scarier as well, of course, but that's when nothing could hit you. And then you imagine that if somebody hacks themselves into it, uh, what they can cause. And of course, there is the, the Jeep case that I talked about the, with the white hackers, uh, Charlie Miller, uh, Chris Valasek, in terms of what they did. They got, by the way, employed by Uber, uh, interesting enough, so a company which is, I'm sure, looking at automation uh, in the car and taxi industry. So this uh, case was 
where they hacked the navigation system of uh, Chrysler, the Jeep. And uh, through that, so they find a hole in the navigation system, after which one they find another hole, which made it possible for them from, to move from the navigation system to actual control system of the car. And then they could actually do, start doing things with the car. And then they wanted to show it, so they informed Chrysler, and they also took a journalist into the car to show him what, what they can do. And uh, this is, of course, the other part of the connected world, which we see, of course, as well, where we need to work hard, and we are doing a lot on our side as well to make it possible to utilize all these great things. It is a beautiful world, but it can be also quite devastating in the wrong hands or if these things get hacked too much. So, uh, and I'm going to show you what the update was done here by Chrysler as an example, because the challenge is that when all the companies are doing their cool new gadgets that are connecting to the internet, they are there to do great products, which is their job, which is what they want to do for the company. But once they get to volumes, then of course, they get more interesting for hacks, but that's also when typically you need to start doing upgrades and you haven't thought about security. Nobody thinks about it from the beginning. I don't believe it's going to happen either so that companies are going to be good at it. So that's something where we, as companies in the security industry, need to go out and make it better and happen. And that's why we are launching some products ourselves as well to help in that space so that security could come even as an afterthought as it is for many companies. So I'm going to show you a second video now uh, with uh, uh, with the, the, the hack and how the journalist is in the car and what it can happen for you, what happened real life for them. Let's show you the other one from, from the Chrysler. After their stunt on the highway, Chris and Charlie still wanted to show me a couple of other tricks. Below a certain speed, they can control the Jeep steering as long as it's in reverse, pop its locks, mess with the speedometer, and, of course, disable the brakes. Okay, hold on tight. Hold on. Oh, So that was the car, and you can imagine with the traffic lights earlier that what it meant actually. So here is the patching process I'm going to show you just shortly, that it is when you don't think about them and you haven't actually done software updates into some product that you are launching. It is not a small thing if it's not built in into the system. So in this case, it became a quite a complex process. Uh, when it comes to the update. So the Chrysler customers got, first they need, needed a four gigabit USB stick. I'm not sure everybody actually knows what a four gigabit USB stick is when they, when they get a request for that. They needed to be able to download a 690 megabit file and follow a complex, which included, by the way, putting the engine on, putting it off, opening doors, closing doors, and then repeating those activities for 60 seconds and, and so forth. And then they had to turn the ignition on and off again, and then to put the USB stick in and out, and actually, you know, it becomes quite cumbersome. And then, of course, a recall was ha had to be done to get the cars back. And I think that this is only one example which shows you why the Internet of Things or Internet of Homes or the connected devices it is a great opportunity for us as an industry, but of course, we need to think about how do we do it so that it is safe to use as well. So too complex, and uh, it's just not thought through. How do you push an update to a car? And I suppose the same will be when it comes to refrigerators or what is out there that is going to be connected. It's not going to be thought through, right? So that, that how do they actually do the updates? So, in cybersecurity, every business is a target. Maybe that's an old news, and we've seen about a 40% increase in terms of the advanced attacks. And I thought that I would run you through, uh, because in our business, uh, I thought that, that uh, when I look at the security incidents, I thought I would give you a picture. What is, we talk about advanced threats, and some of them are not actually so advanced, and attacks. So I thought that I would take you through. We have a team uh, of ethical hackers, we call it. The team is basically, you order them, and they will basically do the testing that I said. They will do a testing of your company. And um, we, there is a saying earlier, that I, I know there's a saying that there are two types of companies, those who have been hacked, and those who have been hacked but don't know about it, it's probably not so that every company has been hacked. I, so I'll rather use these words in this one, 
which is that I, there, those companies who have, there are two companies, those who have been hacked and those who can be breached, but nobody good enough has actually bothered yet. And when I talk about that, I'll show you now. So we have, I'll show you two cases. So our ethical hacking team uh, is, is a brilliant team. And they will then on order and will sign a get out of jail card. So, so uh, there is no implications. We typically do it with the leadership of a company. Some big companies who invested a lot into security, they want to see that, are we really good? And I'll show you two examples. And in a way, to answer the second point here is that our ethical hacking team so far has never failed. So 100% hit rate. We always get in. We always get to what we want, what we have agreed that we will try out. It's a bit scary in a way, but that's the way it is, right? But that tells you also that when I talked about that, you need to understand what's important to you, how do you protect that's what is important to you, and then, of course, how do you test it, and how do you recover in case somebody gets in for you? So I'm going to run through ca two, two cases, so bear with me. I'll show you one of the first one was actually not, it was nothing of complexity. So this was kind of from our guy's point of view, it was too easy. But, you know, they wanted, they, they wanted to do it, so I'll show you one very simple and one a little bit more complex. Not, the, not cyber complex, but a little. So uh, the first one uh, is, was a major Scandinavian bank. We're obviously not going to give any names of what it was, uh, which companies, but... but uh, and the assignment was get access to their mainframe. We don't know where the mainframe is. Uh, we don't know we, what office or what cellar, where it might be, but get access to the mainframe of that bank. And obviously, the, all the big banks in the world have invested quite a lot into their defense and capabilities to recognize. So let's see how, we, how the guys did it. I'm going to go through this uh, in one way for you so you get a view that that's the mainframe. This was the target. Uh, our guys are kind of uh, always getting quite excited when they have a ja task to try to see how they do. And then we need to, the job is to get in and to leave a little bit of a, leave something there that prove, of a kind of proof that we have been here. Nothing, of course, in any way damaging, but just a proof point that we've been there. And this is the easy case, right? So uh, basically just social media. So what do you do, right? So the guys... This is almost too easy, right? So it's, it's not nice when it's too easy. So they just go to social media, LinkedIn is a great tool. And uh, you know, you write there the bank and mainframe. And everybody is writing there, you know, you all write on LinkedIn exactly what you do and which office you are, and you write everything about yourself there, right? So, oh guys, just take a look, okay. And we find about the few 10 guys, we find about 10, they find about 10 people who are the key people in terms of the mainframe. Clearly, because they, they belong to communities which deal with mainframe, and they're very interested in anything to do with mainframe. And that's, of course, what they do as a job, and they're very proud about their capabilities in that space. And uh, so then, we, I'm not going to go through all exactly what happened, but just to give you a picture. So, so then we did a little bit, at first, just the information gathering, which is like, takes you a few minutes, and you have a picture of where to go, which office to go to. Uh, then, actually, very simple social engineering, which is <laughs> the most easy in the world, tailgating. You just walk into the office, you look at the reception, you sit there a while, you talk to people, and then you, of course, uh, very soon see what kind of fake access cards they have, and you make one, it's very easy to do a fake access card, and then you have a fake access card, and you walk in the office, and then you're strolling around. So our guys are testing always this. They walk around the office, they talk to people, uh, people are very helpful, of course, and that's uh, very nice. People are very nice. They want to help out, and it's good people, so that's where you get a lot of information. And uh, find the right building and the context. And then uh, uh, they, what they did was, uh, then when we were inside, we basically just registered a domain and created a website. Our Christ created a website, which was a mainframe, uh, uh, and pretended to be a new mainframe product. And then because we knew the people, we knew the emails, of course, from the social media and the gathering of info, so we sent them an email uh, which contained a new link into the frame, mainframe, and the target was to make it easy to access. So, you, you know, it wasn't from the internal IT people. They get an email that, please, we have made a new access for you into your new mainframe. Why don't you try this out? And, and then they write their, you know, password and, and the user ID, and bang, they go in. And then, of course, bang, we are in. And uh, 
we knew enough of the people to, and from the company by just these simple steps to actually make it very real. So the website, the mainframe, everything looks very real. The text was real and felt real. And of course, after that, it was easy. We had actually access. And we logged in using the credential and left a little trace there uh, in terms of having in the mainframe. So this was the easy case where we actually didn't do anything fancy even. The guys, you know, from the guy's point of view, was really pure basics to do that. Now let's take another case for you. So when we talk about advanced threats, uh, not, they're not always advanced. And this gives you a little bit of picture of what it means to get in. So this was another case. This was much more uh, uh, complex, and, uh, and uh, which made the guys uh, uh, kind of, they feel better when they are okay, they have to work for it at least. And they have to see what, what kind of holes they find. So this was a major online gaming company. So they, of course, have huge volumes, and, and their biggest risk is not, of course, that you get into the, to the money flow, but also a risk that somebody gets into their source code, which means that you can rig the games. You can rig who wins. You can rig what the, what the, what the profits are. You can rig a lot of stuff when you get to the source code of the game, so you can move money around, and you can be a player, and actually you know that you're going to win. And, and it's an interesting situation, of course, if you would ever gain access to the Casino source code. That, so the target was to steal the online casino source code this time for the guys. And now we needed to do a little bit of stuff, but very simple. Cost you not a lot of money, tens of maybe hundred, two hundred dollars to do some of this stuff. So first we needed to, of course, we didn't know which office it is again. Where is the source code? Which server? Where can we find it? So first we, the guys, needed to do a. a persistent rogue uh, box, right? So we would find a network access. So we build a box that actually has access in, into the Wi-Fi or into the wireless LAN networks and has a 3G back channel inside it. So we no now we have a box. We need to get it inside that company uh, in somewhere, right? Then the second thing they did was a guys built that, OK, these guys are good on security, so they will not go for email phishing. They will not open up the files. We were very happy that they didn't go for the simple ones, you know, click on and open up files. So we sent them an email, which is the right text and from the right people, and they just opened it. They were good. So that was great. They, they really didn't go for that one. So then we built a new security product, which was a SSL stick. And, and the idea was that we will send it uh, with a USB stick, this uh, new product, uh, which was on a website that you could look at. They created a website, that guys, and then we sent these. We did some nice brochures, and we sent it to the guys, which we found again. If I started, then we have a USB stick that installs, actually, a rootkit and a keylogger, right? So it will log everything that happens once you put the USB stick in. Don't put USB sticks into your PCs, people, right? Don't put USB sticks. Right? Think about it, you know? So we had these two products ready made for us, and then we did the usual again. We started with, once again, going to LinkedIn. And now we looked at what are the developers, source code developers of the online company. Of course, everybody tells on the LinkedIn that I'm the source code developer of this online company. So then we had the names of the guys very fast, once again. We went to the, then we understood which office they are in, so the same typical way, go in, do the tailgating, get access to the place, and then we could plant. You go to the reception, and then you know who's there, you got the, uh, you got the access card, and then you say, I'm going to go to the meeting room. What, now I forgot the Wi-Fi password again. Okay, the reception gives it to you. We put the box in. We are in the network, right? And we have 3G access out of it. So now we are inside the network. And then we, then we sent the mail with the SSL sticks, over to the guys, and of course, many of them put them in uh, and, and took that this is a great new, new product that they try out, and then we are in the PCs. And then we actually started to move around in their network from server to server, because we need, knew that to get the source code, we have to have system admin rights. And then finally, we got through that, and we got into the source code, and we put a little note there inside the source code to the guys so that we've been here. Bingo. Job done. So there are three problems if I look at those cases. The attacks are growing fast, 40% of the year. They are getting through, and it takes too long time to detect and respond. I think that this is causing a lot of damage. You can't wait for a year or two or 18 months. So basically, just build the systems so that you can find it faster. And uh, we have a chain of compromise where we, where we go through it. And we have built products because we have ethical hackers 
So we have a solution now, uh, rapid, rapid detection service that actually just, it's like a cybersecurity alarm system. So it's emotion detector, somebody's inside, so it just puts the alarm up and recognizes, and then we will, you will be noticed within 30 minutes about somebody being inside and not within a year when somebody from the outside tells you that you've been hacked. So that's how we, we try to work on this one from, this is the way the compromise happens and this is the way our guys had done it as well as you saw. It's very systematic, quite simple actually, how you get access inside the companies. And cybersecurity for us is a process and in a good way, we work from this one. This is a very typical frame in the industry. We have also the solutions for it. And I think the good part of this one, if I look at it in the future, if I look at it the future now, in terms of prevent and detect that the endpoint is back. Yes, endpoint is back because that's where the data is. It is in the servers or in the endpoint. So being in the endpoint is good as well. And we have then, the, when we look at building for the future now, to make it possible to not only prevent and detect, but also respond fast and start predicting. That's where we use the tools and also the ethical hacking team, so that you know where your holes are. You should know what's the most important thing for you. And then when you build for the future, so we also use as the whole industry now, artificial intelligence and threat analysis is much stronger. So whatever happens, we react too fast. We have invested a lot into, into this category in terms of advanced threat protection, rapid response, and build our cybersecurity capabilities. And with the endpoint being back in the game, it's not only about the network, but the combined effort with the services capability. So in a sum, from my point of view, understand what are the key points, what are the data you don't want to miss, how do you protect that at least, and how do you train that or test that it's safe? And how do you respond when somebody is interested enough to hack you? And when you do that, you should be quite OK. It's good to be online. I hope you got a picture of what the world entails. We hope to keep it on the good side of the fence. Thanks a lot on my behalf. OK, we've got time maybe for a question from the audience. Any questions? None? Anyone back there? Oh, there's one right here. Uh, in the far right on the left. Yes, um, I would like to know uh, what costs are involved to protect your company against uh, cyber attacks. And uh, as we are in the home turf of Volkswagen, I would like to know um, how is it uh, possible to use exactly these uh, defense devices in a way that is not very ethical? Uh, sorry, what was the first question I didn't hear? It was about what it... It was about <coughs> the costs involved for a company that uh, wants to protect um, its uh, core data against cyber attacks. I suppose that's very hard to say the direct co cost, but I, I think it goes... Uh, I mean, the easiest are in the tens of thousands in terms of defense. Some are, then that's smaller businesses. Uh, I suppose these kind of systems, when you put more advanced threat protection, you are in the hun over 100,000, 200,000 euro a year. And then if you are big companies, of course, invest millions. If you take the big global companies, invest millions in terms of not only personnel, but having their own cybersecurity units. Uh, and when you, of course, start building cybersecurity units, uh, then it's a lot of people and, and hard to keep the competence up, of course, as well. So it's a wide scale depending on what is important for you, right? And then you said uh, the second question was that how, if I understand right, the second question was that how do you avoid uh, these ethical tools not becoming unethical, right? And, and from our point of view, of course, that's what I, we are very cautious with. It's, our brand is built on that one. It's very, very clear. A company from Finland uh, needs to be ethical, needs to be very strong on that capability. So we have a rigor testing for those people who get into that unit in the first place, right? And I haven't seen too many of those people who are on the good side to actually jump on, on the fence 
uh, to the other side, actually. There hasn't been too many I haven't heard, and I haven't seen, have to knock on wood in our company, that people, it's, it's almost like you move from a, from a, a good city, law-abiding cities and into a criminal. It's not an easy jump, actually. It's a big, big shift to make, and I think you, you do that pretty early in life in many cases. And I suppose that's where countries which are now getting online, where there are not enough jobs, where you are a smart young kid, and you don't find real jobs for you where you might be enticed into moving to the wrong part of it because it's so much money involved in this play. All right, very good. Any more questions? Yeah, there was one more here. Right here. Um, one question about batching uh, a car with the Jeep example. Do you think the direct batching method of Tesla is good or bad for security? Uh, I don't know I don't know the details of how Tesla is doing it. I think it is the I think it is the right way to build the systems for updating automatically when you do design it. Now I don't know enough about the Tesla update to say if it's good or bad, and and uh, we would actually need to then test it to to say that. But I think it's a good thing to have that process and build it from the beginning. It's a big difference I think because if you are going to have a software defined product, you better think about the update. Absolutely. Hello. Um, wondering a little bit about uh, whether we need to protect the entire enterprise. It seems like the costs are going up because we are protecting the entire enterprise. But one of the key messages I got from you is that we need to figure out what is the critical data, what's the nightmare scenario for each of our enterprises, and how do we protect that? But at, at the same time, there's no solution that I know that just focuses on the essentials, um, you know, just protect the entire traditional perimeter generally. Yeah, exactly. That's what I showed the categories, right? Uh, you, uh, you need to define what's the most critical for you. And I think you always need defense. So you need the endpoint protections and the protection inside the company. But then you need to have this capability to, to find when some, some, somebody's in. I think that's the second layer that you go for, which is more advanced. So that's the cybersecurity alarm system or the rapid detection service that we have, which we have launched, right? So the idea there is that you will actually then, when somebody gets in, so as you saw from my example, if they're willing and capable, they will find a way. So then you need to have a system that actually basically knows how a hacker moves and how a hacker hides. And then that brings up the alarm system. And then you can respond fast. I think that would be the levels that I would go. And that's probably what the industry is looking at for those bigger companies. They know that you need, the, you know, you need to lock the doors. But if somebody gets in time, you need a motion detector uh, to figure it out and then respond fast. OK. I think my time is up. Thanks a yep. lot. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. We thank appreciate you. it. Thank you.